Hello and welcome to another episode of Underworld Diary. If you have been enjoying the stories told on this channel feel free to hit the like and subscribe buttons below and help the channel grow. On today's episode, we will take a look into the story of a powerful Philadelphia mobster who would be involved in a violent war with Nicodemia Scarfo. This is Harry the Hunchback Riccobini. At first glance the 4 foot 11, mafioso wasn't the most opposing figure, however, with his quick temper and willingness to resort to violence. Riccobini would be seen as one of the toughest mafia members in Philadelphia. Not willing to back down Riccobini would instantly clash heads with Nicky Scarfo when Scarfo took over the family. Not complying with the new boss's rules, Riccobini would see himself become the prime target of one of the most violent bosses in the history of organized crime. Harry Riccobini was born in 1909 in Enna, Sicily where he lived briefly before immigrating to the United States, with his father leaving for the States to pursue work. In the coal mines, Riccobini and his family would go join him in West Virginia in 1913. Growing up in this area, Riccobini would see his dad carry out hard manual labor daily and would help in any way he could. However, the small Riccobini would be undersized to be of real help, as due to a curvature in his spine, Riccobini would be on the smaller side with a hunch in his back his whole life. Moving out of West Virginia and into South Philadelphia, Riccobini's father picked up work as a stonemason, whereas the young Riccobini jumped into the streets. However, before Riccobini would commit to this lifestyle completely he would tragically see his mother pass away in 1925. This would leave the now 16-year-old Riccobini without much parental support, as his father would have to work full-time while taking care of Riccobini's growing family. With this lack of support, Riccobini would like many others find support from criminal figures throughout the neighborhood. One of these figures would be a massive bootlegger in the area, Salvatore Sabella. With Riccobini fully committing to a criminal life as prohibition was in full effect in the United States, he would quickly make himself useful to Sabella and his overall operations. His alleged participation with Sabella would be seen as extremely beneficial, as it has been stated that Riccobini would become an official member of the Philadelphia Mafia, in 1927, making him one of the youngest members to ever be made. Being allegedly made at this time Riccobini would experience the turbulent world of the Mafia almost instantly. In this same year, his mentor and boss of the Philadelphia family, Sabella, would be indicted in the murders of Vincent Cocotza and Joseph Zongi, which resulted in him being deported to Sicily, allegedly promoting John Avena to the boss's seat. This was followed by the Castel Marisi War, which saw major players in the Philly family playing key roles in the ongoing feud. This included Sabella returning to the States, where he would ally himself and his family, with the Maranzano faction continuing this fighting until 1931. The Philly family would be in a state of constant change with members, having to quickly adapt to new positions over this time. Having this intense introduction into the life Riccobini was alleged to gain an education, in not only the intricacies of mafia politics but also the many rackets the family operated. This would be useful in the upcoming years, as after the new boss John Avena was murdered in 1936 and Giuseppe Joseph Bruno Dovi came into power, the lucrative business of prohibition would come to an end. This would force Riccobini to move into other established mafia rackets to continue earning cash for himself. Being able to establish himself in these operations over the next decade, Riccobini would allegedly become deeply involved in the narcotics trade. With rests on narcotic charges dating back to the 1920s, Riccobini was said to be a major player in the drug-dealing world since his entrance into the family, with rules around the Mafia's involvement in narcotics being heavily disputed and rarely enforced. Riccobini was able to operate freely, without backlash from the family, however the same could not be said about law enforcement. As in 1950 Riccobini would have multiple run-ins with law enforcement surrounding his involvement with narcotics. This started in 1952 when the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics called Riccobini quote an important Midwest narcotics wholesale trafficker. This statement would be followed by his conviction in Baltimore for conspiring to purchase heroin, in which he would receive a year in jail. This was followed by a major arrest in 1954 when over five members of the Buffalo, Philadelphia, and Cleveland families were indicted in a large heroin wholesaling operation. Finding himself wrapped up in this arrest, Riccobini would be convicted and sent to two and a half years in prison. This charge would only further the interest of law enforcement, who would double down on earlier claims, stating that Riccobini is quote the number one man in the drug racket in Philadelphia. 
In a familiar turn of events, this statement would be followed by Riccobini's arrest in 1956, where he would be convicted of heroin dealing in Philadelphia. For this offense, Riccobini would receive a 15-year sentence, taking him off the streets until the 70s. After serving his prison time and dealing with his outstanding legal issues, Riccobini would return to the streets of Philadelphia looking to pick up exactly where he left off. The now 66-year-old well-established mafioso would receive instant respect from many members upon his return. With his roots and the family going back to prohibition, it is said many members would look to align themselves with the aging mobster. This would see Riccobini being able to build up his own crew over the following years where he would establish a strong numbers rackets as well as loan sharking, gambling, and methamphetamine dealing operations. Building these businesses up Riccobini would earn a massive amount of money for himself and the family. This was said to buy him favor with the then boss of the family Angelo Bruno. Angelo was said to give Riccobini a lot of space in operating his businesses, allowing Rick and Bean to create his own section of the family. This would be great for Riccobini over the following years until this arrangement would be thrown out the window following the murder of Bruno. Being able to re-establish himself in the five years he was out of prison, Riccobini would look to stay under the radar as he grew his operation. However, in 1980 the underworld of Philadelphia witnessed the shocking murder of the respected boss Angelo Bruno. This hit would shake the stable Philadelphia family and would be followed by over a decade of violence. The next major act of violence would be seen the next year, as the new boss of the family Philip Chicken Mantesta would be killed by a nail bomb planted in front of his house. With two bosses being killed in two years, the commission would step in looking to put an end to the violence. From here Nico Demo Scarfo would be appointed the new boss of the family. Scarfo would look to settle the family down after the last few years but would elect to do this through violence and threats instead of the trademark diplomacy his predecessor Bruno would use. Over this time Scarfo would take out anyone he suspected of being unloyal while muscling in on other organized crime groups in the region. Scarfo would go as far as implementing attacks on anybody looking to operate an illicit business in the area. Seeing the violence that followed the refusal to pay this tax, most in the area would reluctantly pay Scarfo. However, when members of the Scarfo crew approached Riccobini regarding this new tax, Riccobini was said to outright refuse, stating that he would not pay. This would be seen as disrespectful to the new boss and result in an internal war within the Philadelphia crime family. Infuriated by Riccobini's refusal to pay him a percentage of his profits, Scarfo would look to not just take a percent, but take over the entire Riccobini operation. In order to do this it is alleged that Scarfo turned to high-ranking member Frank Monti to carry out this hit. The smart Riccobini would be hard to track down for Monti, so he would allegedly turn to Riccobini's half-brother Mario to help him with this hit. Hearing of a rift between Mario and Harry, Monti thought that Mario would provide useful information on how to take out Harry. However, this would be a huge miscalculation as Mario was said to immediately go to Harry to tell him about this plot. Harry was said to be furious about this and would allegedly order Mario and two of his crew members Joseph Padula and Victor De Luca to quote get them before they get us. After this conversation, the hit crew would allegedly begin to follow the daily routine of Frank Monty, looking for an opportunity to take him out. Finding an opportunity to do this the crew was said to be the ones responsible for shooting in killing Monty as he stood beside his Cadillac with a sniper rifle. This attack would of course infuriate Scarfo, but at the time he would be in prison due to a firearms charge. This would result in an attempted hit on upcoming Mafia heavyweight and Scarfo loyalist, Selvi Testa, who would survive the attack. Scarfo seeing this violence ratcheting up would allegedly get orders out to escalate the violence against Riccobini and his crew. This saw Riccobini being shot five times while in a phone booth where he would not only survive the shooting but was said to have wrestled the gun away from the much bigger assailant, saving his own life. When the cops arrived at the scene, they were said to have found Riccobini holding an empty gun, to which they asked him where he got it from. The wounded Riccobini would reply by saying quote the other guy was done with it. That would be the extent of the information Riccobini provided to the police, as he would remain tight-lipped about who was responsible. After this failed hit, Riccobini was shot at once again, when sitting in his car, where he was once again able to survive the attack. Surviving the ongoing attacks, allegedly, ordered by the Scarfo faction, Riccobini would ultimately be taken off the streets by someone in his own crew, as his half-brother Mario would turn government informant providing the government 
with information about the Philadelphia Mafia and the crimes committed by Harry. The information Mario provided would lead to the arrest of Riccobini as well as major members of his faction. Taking these men off the street would see the Scarfo family looking to take advantage, as the remaining members of this faction would be taken out over this time. This would allegedly include the murder of Robert Riccobini, who was killed with a shotgun in front of his mother. The violence between the factions would come to an end in the mid-80s with the majority of Riccobini's faction being imprisoned or killed. This would leave Riccobini to focus on his upcoming trial against his half-brother. Indicted on first-degree murder charges regarding the murder of Frank Monty, Harry Riccobini would not only deny his participation in this murder but would deny any involvement in the world of organized crime. On top of this, it has been stated that Riccobini and his defense team would go as far as claiming that he had tried to prevent the three men from committing any violent acts from quote and founded rumors that Scarfo had planned to kill him. Despite all these claims the government would be able to build a solid case against Riccobini, primarily centered around the direct testimony Mario provided to them. With Mario's alleged involvement in the hit, the information provided in the trial would be enough to find Harry Riccobini guilty. From this charge, Riccobini would be sentenced to life imprisonment. While serving his time, Harry. Riccobini would hear about the last victim from his violent past, as in 1993, Mario Riccobini was murdered after leaving the Witness Protection Program. This hit has not been tied to Riccobini himself but has been tied to the Philadelphia underworld and the bloody war between Scarfo and Riccobini. This would be the last act of violence that Riccobini would have a connection to until his death in 2000, where the 91-year-old passed away at the State Correctional Institute in Dallas, Pennsylvania. Thank you for watching another episode of Underworld Diary. If you enjoy the stories told on the channel feel free to hit the like and subscribe button to help the channel grow. If there are any topics you would like to see covered in future videos feel free to leave a comment down below. If not I will see you next time with another story from the underworld.